Blessings, friends of the border town, it's Father Pete. Before I offer the Mass for the Immaculate Conception and my second Advent talk on the calling of Christian couples, I thought it would be nice to offer another song that I've written in 2013 based on the story of a mother and her child. Gift of the night Mother and child within heavens unite. Light of God conquering sin, blessed is the parent who shows us the way to a blessed Merry Christmas, a blessed Holy Day. Each day is a blessing, raising the child in the world, things impressing, both holy and beguiled, caring, protecting the God child obey. For every day is Christmas, a child's holy day. Follow God's calling and doing His will. Rising and falling, the earth in flux, heaven still. Child grows in stature and maturity. Heaven's directing him to Calvary. Mother is grieving the son's sacrifice. Cross is now leading us to heavenly paradise. Love of the mother has saved us from harm. The sun completes mission and rests in her arms. The work of the spirit still guides us back to his grace. Words of God bring to us that holy place. Mother and child provide mercy today. For every day's Christmas, a child's holy day, gift of the night, mother and child within heavens unite. Light of God conquering sin, blessed is the parent who shows us the way to a blessed Merry Christmas, a blessed holy day, a blessed Merry Christmas, a blessed holy day. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Magi had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod, that what the Lord said through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I call my son. When Herod had died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. He rose, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go back there. Because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee. He went and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. For my second talk, I take myself back to the youth ministry days when, in 1988, after my mother had passed away and I left seminary to live with my father for a few years before he got back on track, I was serving as a youth minister at St. Peter and Paul Church in Cary, Illinois which holds the Guinness World Records for the most stained glass windows in a church. At that time, I was in charge of religious education and youth ministry for 6th through 12th graders. Confirmation and all that kind of good stuff, lock-ins, lock-outs, retreats. I learned how to play the guitar, all that kind of good stuff. There was one particular weekend when I was doing my activities when I was attending a Mass at the parish on a Sunday morning. 
And I came to find out that those who were in charge of taking care of the toddlers in their cry room of the church had not shown up. And the parents were becoming a little bit upset. They said, where are the caretakers of our children? What are we supposed to do with them during Mass? So I, of course, thinking that I could take care of kids, and this was long before protecting God's children, I said to the parents, don't worry, I will help you out. I will take care of the kids until someone shows up. Big, big mistake. There is a reason why I am a Catholic priest. I love to minister to kids, and then I love to send them home so that the parents can take care of them the rest of the day. There I was alone with 15, 20 kids, toddlers less than two years old. I had no access to bottles. I had no access to diapers. I had no access to sanity. And when I was sitting there with all these screaming children, I thought to myself, I have the greatest respect for moms and dads who dedicate their lives to taking care of these kids. And I was with a family for dinner a short time back, and one of the couples had their six-year-old and four-year-old running all over the place. And I turned to them and I said, how long does it take before you stop consider your children as cute? And uh, the parents said, well, some say that they're always cute and always beautiful. And I say when they turn five or six years old and start running around all over the place, some will say well, as soon as you have to put on their first diaper, they're no longer cute. It just all depends on the parent, but a parent is always a mom or a dad, and their children are always the most prized possession, the prized gift that God has ever given. So I know this because with my own mother, uh, who dedicated her life to taking care of me, she was the inspiration for my vocation as a priest. What she would do is uh, we would gather around the kitchen table at night, and she would ask us to pray the rosary together. And each of us kids would pray an Our Father, a Hail Mary, a Glory Be. We have in our religious ed program people who are prayer listeners to make sure that the kids are saying the prayers correctly. A lot of our kids don't know the basic prayers. When I was growing up, my mother made sure that these prayers were instilled in our life, not just to say them, but to live them. And because of that inspiration, my mother was really... Uh, a model for the kind of person I should be as a Christian and certainly as a priest. And for that, I was very appreciative of what my mom did. This talk on Christian parents is really inspired by the songs that I've offered about the mom and dad dedicating their life and their sacrifice for the people in their household. This talk is called The Cause for Canonization for married couples. It's based on a talk that was given back in 2001 by St. Pope John Paul II for Luigi and Maria Quattrochi, who were beatified at a special mass that the Pope had offered. This couple who had married for 46 years, who had four children, and three of them entered the religious life. During his homily, St. Pope John Paul II offered these following words about the couple and certainly could apply for all of us, especially those who dedicate their lives raising children. He said, Drawing on the word of God and the witness of the saints, Luigi and Maria lived an ordinary life in an extraordinary way. Among the joys and anxieties of a normal family, they knew how to live an extraordinarily rich spiritual life. At the center of their life was the daily Eucharist, as well as devotion to the Virgin Mary, to whom they prayed every evening with the rosary, in consultation with wise spiritual directors. In this way, they could accompany their children in vocational discernment, training them to appreciate everything from the roof up, as they often charmingly liked to say. Married and family life can also experience moments of bewilderment. We know how many families in these cases are tempted to discouragement. I am particularly referring to those who are going through the sad event of separation. I am thinking of those who must face illness and those who are suffering the premature death of their spouse or of a child. In these situations, one can bear a great witness to fidelity in love, which is purified by having to pass through the crucible of suffering.
I think about my father's wife who continually cares for a husband who is dying of cancer, who lifts up this husband out of love after 27 years of marriage. I think of the three families who I visited today, the day I offer this talk, who asked for me to bless their houses, one in Bradley, two at St. Anne's. Two families uh, here in St. Anne's who are Spanish-speaking, one of which wishes to have their child baptized here in the church on December 20th. I am told this is the first baptism celebrated at St. Anne's over the last two years. We have so many families that are desiring, seeking the sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. We have to find a way to tell people that it is our responsibility and our joy to welcome them into the church, to teach them that the moms and dads of our community are the primary educators of their children. And the way they conduct themselves through action as well as word really teaches their children the ways of the faith. And we want them to come to church. We want to strengthen them with the word and the sacrament to get them out into the world to teach these lessons to their children. I actually researched this homily some years back when I gave it to the diocese, and I realized that there are actually 25 saints who modeled the role of motherhood for the church. It's not an exhaustive list, but it serves at the purpose of this homily and offers me a litany of motherhood that I can utilize in my own prayer life. And I've used this for Mother's Day in previous years. With this in mind, this is why version of a litany that I've offered during my Masses, and especially in the month of May, the month of Mary, the month of Moms. Foremost on this list of mothers, we remember Mary, the mother of God, the Theotokos, the God-bearer who serves as the prototype for sainthood and motherhood in the world. It was her fiat, her words, let it be done to me according to thy word, that serves as a model for all mothers who are called to take care of their children. So to Mary, the mother of God, we ask her, pray for us. I'd like to pray for St. Lydia, who, as we learn in the 16th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, became one of the first converts who followed St. Paul. St. Lydia, convert to the faith, we ask her, pray for us. For the mothers in our martyrology who suffered a martyr's death in their defense of the faith, for the sake of young children, were placed in their care. Saints Perpetua and Felicity, we ask them, pray for us. Saint Carina, her husband and her son, we ask them, pray for us. I would like to also pray for those mothers who raise children who are honored as saints and leaders of the faith, models of example of love that we are called to follow. Saint Salome, mother of the apostles James and John, we ask her, pray for us. Saint Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, we ask her, pray for us. Saint Monica, mother of Saint Augustine, the doctor of the church, we ask her, pray for us. Saint Celine, the mother of Saint Remigius, we ask her, pray for us. Saint Sylvia, mother of Pope St. Gregory the Great, we ask her, pray for us. I would also like to pray for mothers who have served a life as a queen or princess of the faith, who have dedicated their lives to raising their families in the good times as well as bad, as well as taking care of the poor and the underprivileged in their care. St. Matilda, patroness of queens, we ask her, pray for us. St. Elizabeth of Portugal, patroness of the Third Order of Franciscans, we ask her, pray for us. St. Margaret of Scotland, we ask her, pray for us. St. Elizabeth of Hungary, we ask her, pray for us. St. Adelaide, patroness of prisoners, we ask her, pray for us. Finally, I would like to pray for those mothers who have been faithful servants for their families, who founded and served in religious communities and other houses of service. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, the founder of the Daughters of Charity, we ask her, pray for us. St. Louise de Marillac, 
who with St. Vincent de Paul was the co-founder of the Daughters of Charity, we ask her, pray for us. St. Judith, patroness of Prussia, we ask her, pray for us. St. Rita of Cascia, patroness of impossible cases, we ask her, pray for us. St. Bridget of Sweden, we ask her, pray for us. St. Hedwig, we ask her, pray for us. St. Adele, we ask her, pray for us. And St. Jane Francis de Chantal, the founder of the Congregation of Visitation, we ask her, pray for us. Concerning Father's Day weekend, I also compiled a list of heroic men who served as fathers and children of earth. Among those saintly fathers in our martyrology, I'm reducing this particular list to three. Among all the saints in our list who happens to be fathers, these three men represent the type of God-inspired life that all of us are called to live. These men endured the sins that were cast upon them in life, but through Christ, and because of Christ, their lives were redeemed. And so here's the list of the three men I have assembled for my Father's Day homily. To St. Hilary of Cordier, husband and father who was called the Athanasius of the West, whose dedication to the faith caused great suffering to his life and his family. For his dedication to the church, we ask him, pray for us. To St. Louis IX, the King of France and father of 11 children, who offered great devotion and supplication to the church and the clergy of his own country, we ask him, pray for us. To St. Stephen, King of Hungary and defender of the church, whose devotion to his son served as a model of fatherhood for every age, we ask him, pray for us. Concerning saints who were fathers, there is a story, an urban legend, that was told to me by one of my history professors at the university, uh, Father Ted Ross, a Jesuit priest, who told me that at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, St. Pope John XXIII convened all the bishops from around the world, and one of the bishops who came from a communist country had relayed the fact that the only way that he was able to endure and persevere during a time of trial was to pray to St. Joseph, foster father of our Lord. And he wanted to have St. Joseph's name included in the first Eucharistic prayer. The other bishops decided that this was not an important issue and they kind of shot it down and then St. Pope John the 23rd came out of his personal room as he was listening to these talks and on the spot the one thing he did the Second Vatican Council that he accomplished was he stated from that point forward St. Joseph's name would be included in the first Eucharistic prayer. Uh, Pope Francis had decided to include St. Joseph's name in the other Eucharistic prayers as well because the role of the Father should not be diminished. What St. Joseph did by adopting Jesus into his life allowed Jesus to adopt us into his and that all of us are one family of God. For me, there's a quality about St. Joseph's labor and his life and the quiet way that he conducted himself that is so important to me and that's the same thing that we priests have to do as fathers of our community very quietly, very lovingly, do everything that is necessary to protect the most sacred gift that God has given us, the children of our society. Towards that goal, I often turn to a prayer of St. Pope Pius X is an inspiration for the kind of life I wish to live. This is what he wrote. Glorious St. Joseph, model of all who are devoted to labor, obtain for me the grace to work in the spirit of penance in expiation of my many sins to work conscientiously by placing love of duty above my inclinations, to gratefully and joyfully deem it an honor to employ and develop by labor the gifts I have received from God, to work methodically, peacefully, and in moderation and patience without ever shrinking from it through weariness or difficulty to work. Above all, with purity of intention and unselfishness, having unceasingly before my eyes death and the account I have to render of time lost, talents unused, good not done, and vain complacency and success, so baneful to the work of God, all for Jesus, all for Mary, all to imitate thee, O Patriarch St. Joseph, 
This shall be my model for life and for eternity. Of all the words that I've heard from all the saintly popes, from all the saintly moms and dads who have made this sacrifice for the sake of their children, I would like to return to a Proto-Evangelium of James. The story of how our Blessed Mother came into the world protected by the power of the Holy Spirit. I spoke about the role of Mary and Joseph in our life. In the Catholic Church, of all the saints that we honor, there are so few couples who are recognized as saints because of their roles as moms and dads. All our martyrs, founders of churches, people who have suffered, very few couples have been recognized for the gift of being good parents. I think to myself that that number has shortchanged us because the role of moms and dads is so taken for granted in our society that we forget on how important they are. And that's why when Pope John Paul II beatified uh, Maria and Luigi Quattrochi, he talked about the importance of parents in our society and how we need to do the same thing because without that formation, these children will be lost in the darkness and that seems to be the case in today's age. We are not doing a good enough job in telling kids that God loves them, that we will protect them, and that they're welcome in church. For whatever reason, they are not coming to church. We are not doing a good enough job. We have to be better parents. I have to be a better pastor. We have to be good fathers and mothers to the kids of our society. And for all these couples who have dedicated their lives for taking care of us, we have to model that same kind of life. As we conclude these two Advent Talks, perhaps I give you a challenge that you might take back to your own prayer life. I want you to think about couples in our own community who have modeled this kind of faith life and lift them up in prayer and ask God to bless them as those who have served very well their families and the parishes in which they live. I was thinking about a couple back in one of my former parishes who had numerous children who, uh, one of them was wheelchair bound, and they would come every Sunday and sit in the front row of church and give thanks to God for the gifts of life that they had. I thought of another couple who came to visit me at uh, my current parish at St. Patrick. Uh, they traveled all the way from Joliet with all their children and grandchildren uh, after 50 years of marriage to give thanks to God and to the people of the community who have served them well and whom they have served. I think about the couples who have been honored as Catholic saints in our church who have modeled this kind of life. Perhaps we can think and we can pray of the other couples in our community who have lived really holy lives. Perhaps it's an opportunity to recognize them in the Chancery Office, to write to the bishop, to make sure that these couples are not forgotten for their service. As we know in the newspapers and in the magazines, that lots of folks are recognized for doing all kinds of public things. But so often, it is the moms and dads at our community who do the little things, as St. Pope John Paul II said. He said he, they did ordinary things in extraordinary ways. And I'd like to remember those families and those couples who very quietly have done God's will by loving their families. We certainly remember the grandparents of our Lord, St. Joachim and St. Anne, for the gift of the Blessed Mother that they brought into the world. For them, we ask them to pray for us. We pray for St. Zechariah and St. Elizabeth, who dedicated their life to raising their son, John the Baptist, the last great prophet and the first great saint prior to Jesus. For him, we ask him, pray for us. For our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, for sacrificing their lives for raising their child, the Savior of the world, and ask them to pray for us. We pray for St. Priscilla and Achilla, who supported St. Paul in his ministry and offered their love to the Gentile people. We ask them, pray for us. 
for St. Isidore the Farmer and his wife, uh, Maria de la Cabeza, for their sacrifice on the land to provide sustenance for those who are in need. We ask them, pray for us. And for Louis and Zeely Martin, the parents of St. Therese of Lisieux, a beautiful, sacred doctor of the church, for their dedication to her and their entire family, we ask them, pray for us. And on behalf of all these families, on behalf of all those who quietly have lived this life of faith, I thought it would be appropriate to offer a prayer to Joseph, Mary, and Jesus that is utilized in a novena prayed nine days before the Feast of the Holy Family, whose gospel reading I use to preface this talk. May our prayers and our dedication to promoting the virtues of the Christian family not be lost. May we never take our families for granted. May we pray for all Christian couples who dedicate their lives as setting a model of faith for their children. Here is the prayer. Most loving Jesus, by your sublime and beautiful virtues of humility, obedience, poverty, modesty, charity, patience, and gentleness, you blessed with peace and happiness the family which you chose on earth. In your mercy, look upon my family. We belong to you, for we have received your many blessings over many years, and we entrust ourselves to your loving care. Look upon our family in your loving kindness. Preserve us from danger. Give us help in time of need. Grant us the grace to persevere to the end in imitation of your holy family, so that having revered you and loved you faithfully on earth, we may praise you eternally in heaven. Mary, dearest mother, to your intercession we have recourse, knowing that your divine Son will hear your prayers. Glorious Patriarch St. Joseph, help us by your powerful prayers. Offer our prayers to Jesus, through Mary's hands. Amen. May God bless all of you. This is our prayer. Keep well, dear Mary. Be well, dear Mary. Alone in the darkness, let God